Song leading is a very important thing in the church, and I think oftentimes, I, I've preached in, oh, maybe five, 600 churches now, way over towards 600 churches, and have a lot of experiences in church services. I've been saved for 37 years, and um, been in a lot of church singing services. Our text this afternoon is 1 Chronicles 25, verses 1 through 7. 1 Chronicles 25, verses 1 through 7. And the song service is a very important thing in the church. It was a very important thing in the Old Testament, in the temple. David, in particular, even designed and uh, built different musical instruments and set up a very elaborate system of music and singing in the temple and uh, in, in the tabernacle before the temple. And this was carried over into the temple system when Solomon built the first temple. First Chronicles 25, verses 1 through 7. Moreover, David and the captains of the hosts separated to the service of the sons of Asaph and of Heman and of Jeduthun, who should prophesy with harps, with psalm trees, and with cymbals, and the number of the workmen according to their service. Now they prophesied with musical instruments. Verse 5, all these were the sons of Heman, the king's seer, in the words of God to lift up the horn. And God gave to Heman 14 sons and three daughters. All these were under the hands of their father for song in the house of the Lord, with cymbals, psalm trees, and harps for the service of the house of God. And so we see that they set up a quite an elaborate system. There were many men involved in the leadership and the, and the playing of instruments there. And we see that they were prophesying through these musical instruments, preaching, prophesying, not just with words, but with the instruments and with the music that was there, with the harps and with the psalteries and with the cymbals and the horns and different instruments. It was an orchestra. We know that not every church has a gifted song leader, but we believe that every church can select the best men that it has to lead singing, and we can also try to perfect ourselves and, and, and through training, just like a preacher should. And this afternoon, I want to give some seven simple suggestions for song leading that I believe characterize good song service and a good song leader, and that is, first of all, leadership. The song leader is there to lead the congregation. He's not there to follow the congregation. He's there to lead the congregation, and everything in life needs a little bit of leadership. It's important. The leader's job, the song leader's job, is not just to announce his song numbers, but he's to lead. He needs to lead by explaining what the singing is all about. For example, in Colossians 3.16, what is the singing all about? What are we doing? Colossians 3.16, when we sing songs to the Lord in the church, what are we doing? Or what, uh, I should say, what should we be doing? Colossians 3.16, let the word of Christ dwell in you richly in all wisdom teaching and admonishing one another. So we're, we're teaching, we're admonishing through song. That's what we're supposed to be doing. One another, we're preaching, uh, edifying one another spiritually. Psalms and hymns and spiritual songs, singing with grace in your hearts to the Lord. And so we're singing to one another and we're singing to the Lord. And the worship leader, the song leader, should uh, uh, remind the people, at least from time to time, of what we're doing. We need to be reminded. We need to have our attention drawn out from the things of the world. We leave the world. We come into the house of God. We got a lot of other things going on in our life. And the song leader should very simply... Not long, drawn-out uh, 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 things, but very simply draw our attention here to what we are doing so that we turn our hearts toward what we're doing. And the song service is not just a vain ritual. First Chronicles 15, 22, I believe we see this. 
First Chronicles 15, 22. First Chronicles 15, 22. And Chedaniah, chief of the Levites, was for Saul. He was for Saul. He instructed about the song because he was skillful. He instructed about the song. And that's one of the jobs of a song leader. Secondly, he should lead by exhorting the people to think about the words and to sing heartily. Again, we need leadership in this. We need somebody to remind us of these things, of what we're doing and what we need to be doing. Look with me at Psalms for a minute. Of course, we've got a whole book of Psalms in the Bible. That's how important this is to God. A hundred and fifty of them. Let's look at a few of them. Psalm 30, verse 4. That's what the psalmist is doing here. Exhorting the people to think about the words, to sing heartily these uh, glorious things about God. Psalm 30, verse 4. Sing unto the Lord. Who's he talking to? Sing unto the Lord. Talking to the people of God. All ye saints of his. And give thanks at the remembrance of his holiness. See, he's exhorting the people about singing. Sing to the Lord. Give thanks for his holiness. Lift up your heart in gratitude. Psalm 34, verse 3. Oh, magnify the Lord with me. And let us exalt his name together. That'd be a good verse to read before the song service. Psalm 47, 6 and 7. The Psalms are full of this. A few examples. Psalm 47, 6 and 7. Sing praises to God. Sing praises. Sing praises unto our King. Sing praises. He's exhorting. For God is the King of all the earth. Sing ye praises with understanding. Ye, that's plural. Let's all sing praises, he said. Psalm 113, verse 1. Psalm 113, verse 1. Praise ye the Lord. Praise ye, all ye servants of the Lord. Praise the name of the Lord. Ye, he's talking to plural, to the people of God. Praise the Lord. Psalm 135, verse 1. Praise ye, ye plural, the Lord. Praise ye the name of the Lord. Praise him, all ye servants of the Lord. That's a good verse to read before a song service. Psalm 147, verse 1. 147, verse 1. Praise ye the Lord. For it is good to sing praises unto our God. It is, for it is pleasant and praise is calmly. It's an exhortation to the people of God. Psalm 149, verse 1. Praise ye the Lord, sing unto the Lord a new song and his praise in the congregation of the saints. There's a good verse to read before song service. And so the, the psalmist is exhorting the people of God, hey, let's stop and think about what we're doing. Let's lift up our voices to God. Let's get our hearts involved in this song service and let's praise the Lord. It's the job of a song leader. He must lead. We forget these things. We come into the church thinking about many other things, and we need to be uh, brought in to, to what we're supposed to be doing. Lead by explaining what the singing's all about. Lead by exhorting the people to think about the words and think heartily, uh, sing heartily. And lead also by explaining the message of difficult song, uh, songs. Like Beulah Land. What's Beulah Land mean? We sing, oh, Beulah Land. Oh, Beulah Land, what is Beulah Land? It's not going to mean anything to me if I don't know what Beulah Land is. It'll mean nothing. It'll be just a vain, a religious ritual if we don't know the meaning of the words. And the song leaders should not give long explanations and stop and and preach many sermons. That destroys the uh, song service as far as I'm concerned. But little short explanations like, folks, Beulah Land means married land. One day we're going to be, uh, that land will be married to the Lord, that land there in Israel when Jesus comes back. But we're married to the Lord today. We're going to live there. Just a little short thing. What is Beulah? Ebenezer. I raised mine Ebenezer. Will you raise your what? What is it? If we don't know what it is, well, it means uh, uh, the stone of the Lord. And it was a, 
uh, was a, uh, a testimony where Samuel built uh, to, to celebrate the victory, the Jewish victory over the Philistines. And we, when we have victories that God gives us over the devil and the world and the flesh, we need to celebrate those victories. And that's what it's all about, the victories that God gives us in this life and the eternal victory that He's given us in Christ. Ebenezer, just simple explanations. Song leaders should also lead with their voices, or at least their hands if they can't sing, uh, uh, hold a tune. There was a fellow in a, in a church we were members of in Washington State for several years. There was a fellow, uh, he was an usher, in fact, that had such a terrible voice. He had, it, it was one of the worst I've ever heard. But he loved to sing. Oh, he was bold in his singing and loud. And so as an usher, he would have to come down the rows to come in front, you know, to pick up the offering plate as one of the ushers. Well, he would come down our row. And it was always interesting to hear that as he walked down the row singing real loud, and because they were always singing at that time, he'd throw every row off key all the way down. Well, if you've got a voice like that, it's probably better to lead with your hands or something. There's one fellow I know, the best song leader I've ever heard probably, the, in a church in North Carolina. He, his name is Brubacker, and he travels, at least he used to, with uh, Ron Comfort and the evangelistic team. But he leads with a trombone, and it's, it's very beautiful. It's very exciting. But whatever, the song leader's job is to lead. And so the mark of good song leading, first of all, is to lead. Secondly, a mark of good song leading is preparation. Preparation. The song leader represents the church. More than that, he represents Jesus Christ. Everything we do, representing the Lord, we're in the service of the Lord. He's going to reward us or not. He's paying attention to that. The parables teach us that. The judgment seat of Christ teaches that. And uh, the song leader should be prepared if at all possible. Sometimes you get appointed to, to lead singing on the spur of the moment. You've got Excuse me, you've got no choice in that matter, but on an ongoing basis, if it's your job, you should be prepared for that, whatever it is, and not just come scurrying in. I remember growing up in a Southern Baptist church, and our, our Sunday school teacher, he was never prepared. That was obvious. He'd come in and read that old boring Sunday school uh, uh, material they had. But just read it. I can read. I don't need somebody to read for me. And, uh, but that's a lack of preparation, and it dishonors the Lord. Need to be prepared. Need to be prepared in our hearts by prayer, seeking God's blessing, seeking God's power, not just thinking God's going to bless us because He wants to bless us. He does, but He requires that we seek His blessing by preparing His own heart before the Lord for the service, by choosing songs wisely. When we choose songs for song service, we need to consider the congregation, the people that's going to be singing. Maybe they're two years old. Maybe they're 14 years old. Maybe it's a mixed congregation. And we need to take that in consideration, but also the occasion. What kind of song do we need? Well, there's a lot of songs in the songbook, but they're not all for the same purpose. It's not just open it up and see what I've got here. It's choosing the right song for the right occasion which takes preparation. We had a prophecy conference in the last meeting, and uh, one of the songs I believe that was sung was Send the Light. Well, okay, that's a great song, but it wasn't really fitting. In fact, uh, except for one song chosen by the pastor, none of the songs were really fitting for that conference. And I could have chosen, had I had opportunity, some great songs that would have really fit the subject of prophecy and certain things, but it, it, they weren't chosen. It wasn't the right song for the right occasion. We need to choose songs wisely and, if possible, study music. And music is not a deep, complicated thing. It, it can be if you, if you want to get a doctor's degree in it. But to learn how to read music is not a difficult thing. It's no more difficult. It's not as difficult as learning to read. It's a matter of what you want to do in life. Whether you want to learn a few things, whether you want to keep on learning a few things, or just stay where we are. And too many times we're just to content to, well, I don't know that. Okay, you don't know that, but you can learn that. But I don't want to learn anything. Well, that's ignorance, folks. And it should not have a, a great place in the ministry of Christ. Learning. 
No, you can learn how to read music. And learning to read music is a great advance in being able to lead music. Because at least I can take any of these songs, and I don't have to have any instrument around, and I can read it just like a book. I can tell you the tune because I can read music, and it's not hard to learn to do that. And then uh, if you want to, you can learn chords and things. can even learn how to play the, an instrument a little bit. That's not that hard to learn at a basic level, but preparation. That's the second mark of good leading. The third mark is edification. 1 Corinthians 14 is about church services. It's about the exercise of spiritual gifts in the church services. In 1 Corinthians 14, the theme is edification. And Paul emphasizes this repeatedly 20 times in this chapter. We find the words edify and know and understand because that's what the church service is all about. Meaning, understanding. And in verse 26, Paul says this, Let all things, all things, be done unto edifying in the church. Everything. And so there's no place for entertainment in the church service. The sole objective is spiritual edification. Every song should be selected for its message. And if the song is weak, there's no edification there. Edification is spiritual uplifting, building the spiritual man up. And if the song is weak, there's not spiritual edification. It might be a little interesting. It might be reminiscent. I've often thought about the church in the Wildwood. It's very popular. It was a very popular song in the church we used to be a member of. If they had a, 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 you know, a, a request of songs, somebody would always say, let's sing the church in the Wildwood. If you'll read the words to that, it doesn't mean, they don't, they don't mean anything. The church in the Wildwood. Well, what about it? Well, it's just kind of a reminiscent thing. And, uh, and uh, you know, in your past, there might have been some little church in the woods somewhere or something. But, but if you read the words, there's nothing real of sub spiritual substance there. We need to choose songs that have some spiritual substance. And also, if the message of the songs is spiritual, but it's couched in words that are not understood by the congregation, there's still not edification. We've already mentioned that. Many of the old hymns have to be, have need some explanation. What about a mighty fortress is our God? Wonderful song. It has these words, Lord, Saboeth is his name, from age to age the same, Saboeth. What is this? Now, if I give you a test this afternoon, I will. Raise your hand if you know what Saboeth is. Raise your hand now if you know. If you don't raise your hand and you do know, I'm going to think every one of you don't know what it is. Okay, one person. Well, the, the pastor knows. We're not even going to ask the pastor now. Let's. Sabbath. No, it's not the Sabbath. It sounds like the Sabbath. It's the Lord of hosts. It's the Lord of hosts. Mighty host of God, which are going to come in the second coming of Christ. Now, if you sing a mighty fortress, this is our God, if you, if you were honest today, and this would be typical, I'm sure, <clears throat> and you sing that, you're not singing with any meaning whatsoever, right? It's just the Lord of Sabbath. Oh, that's the Lord of the Sabbath. But it's not the Lord of the Sabbath. It's the Lord of the host. At least he thought it was the Lord of something. The rest of you didn't have the foggiest idea what it might be. <laughs> no. Nobody knows these words unless we look them up or unless somebody helps us. And then you've got to be reminded, I forgot what Ebenezer was. I had to go into the pastor's office before this service and say, let's hurry up and look up Ebenezer because I'm going to uh, uh, talk to them about Ebenezer today. And I'd forgotten. I wrote that Bible encyclopedia out there. But we need to be reminded of these things. And if we don't sing with meaning, then we're not singing spiritually at all. It's the song leader's job to explain, but again, in a very concise manner. I've, I've heard some song leaders that think it's their job to preach a, several many sermons in the midst of the song, congr, uh, the song service, and I think that uh, is not a good song leading. And so the third mark of good song leading is edification. And then number three, 
the mark of good song leading is that it be spiritual, that he lead in a spiritual manner, and that the song service be spiritual. The Bible says God is a spirit, and they that worship him must worship him in spirit and in truth. And this is very, much, very similar to the other point, but our song services should not be fleshly. That's my point here, which is the whole theme of this music conference, Music in the Home, and we're dealing with and all of the other services, so we're not going to try to deal with that here. But so much of what is coming into independent Baptist churches is fleshly, not spiritual, and it entertains the flesh, and it might make me want to dance, but it is not spiritual, and it is especially coming in through the specials. That's where it comes first. Number five, the a mark of good song leading is truth. Truth. We're not only to worship God in spirit, but in truth. John 4, 24. And so all of the singing and all of the songs must be tested by the word of God. Truth. So that they are doctrinally sound and they conform to the word of God. And so the song leader, that's his job. To go through the lyrics. And make sure they're scriptural. Not all of the songs in the hymn book are scriptural. Most of them are. But not all of them. We have a story to tell to the nations. For the darkness shall turn to dawning, it says. The dawning to new day bright. And Christ's great kingdom shall come to earth. The kingdom of love and light. The second verse says, We have a song to be sung to the nations that shall lift their hearts to the Lord. A song that shall conquer evil and scatter the spear and sword. That was, pre, that was uh, post-millennialism. And the idea that through the preaching of the gospel, the kingdom would be brought in and the nations would be conquered and the kingdom would be brought in through the preaching of the gospel. Post-millennialism, which is false, false teaching. And it's serious false teaching. We should, if we do sing that, we should... At least remind the people that we don't believe this part, that we believe that the kingdom will be brought by the coming of Christ and His power. Majesty, very popular song, often sung even in independent Baptist church churches, but it was written by a four-square Pentecostal pastor, Jack Hayford, a radical charismatic who believes in uh, learning how to speak in tongues. Tongue speaking was a miracle. Nobody in the book of Acts ever tried to learn how to speak in tongues. It was a miracle. To suddenly be able to fluently speak a language that you've never learned is a mighty miracle. And I heard him speak in St. Louis in 2000. Jack Hayford said that his daughter came to him one day and she was very concerned about her tongue speaking. And she said, Dad, I don't think it's language. And he said to her, Well, we've all got to learn to speak. You didn't start speaking Fluently, at first you started speaking baby language, and that's the way it is with tongues, he said. Well, that's nonsense. That's ridiculous. It's, it's heresy. But that song, Majesty, teaches heresy. It teaches uh, kingdom authority. And you go to those conferences, Pentecostal charismatic conferences, where men like that are preaching, and they think that we how, uh, the kingdom is now, and we have the kingdom power now, and we can uh, uh, bring in the kingdom now through our efforts, and that's heresy. And so we need to be very concerned about the doctrinal purity of, a, of our songs. And the song leader, leader, his job is, that's one of his jobs, is to protect the doctrinal purity of the song service. Oftentimes, the unscriptural music enters first through the specials. As I've already mentioned, I was on a preaching trip, and I preached in 12 churches in three countries on that particular trip, and I observed that about half of the churches, these are all independent Baptist churches, and about half the churches allowed special music that was at least mildly contemporary, coming out of the charismatic. And they didn't have a bass guitar, they didn't have a drum kit, they had a piano, but it was contemporary, it was rock ballads. And uh, they were allowing that to come in, either through ignorance or lack of concern. And I, I saw that the men in charge of the music in those churches simply did not understand what was going on and, and therefore were not resisting it. And so truth, mark of good song leading, is to make sure everything is done in truth and doctrinal purity. 
Number six, the mark of good song leading is enthusiasm and a positive attitude. His job is not to get up and make pe people feel bad and, and uh, get into a negative slump, but I think there's a room for positive. People think I'm nothing but negative, but once in a while I get a little positive. But certainly a song leader's job, <laughs> song leader's job is to uplift, to be enthusiastic. There's no reason why our song services should be boring. I can't think of any, although most song services are. Boring. No, really, I, I've been in hundreds of them, and most of them are pretty boring. The song leader has a lot of responsibility there. If he has no enthusiasm, he leads in a boring manner. The congregation will doubtless reflect that. Pastor David Earnhardt is a man, a pastor that I have a lot of respect for. I think he's retired now. But he said, I always avo avoid scolding the crowd for not singing. Don't scold them. That only makes them resent me. You must give them a positive reason for singing heartily and, and, and repeating old cliches. Folks, let's just raise the roof on this verse like that. Soon becomes old and does not work. The song leader must help interpret the meaning of the song and why it should be sung with enthusiasm. That always brings better results. He has a lot of wisdom. And so enthusiasm and a positive attitude. And back in, 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 to the, the, the idea or the, the point of choosing the right song. I've gone through the, uh, I don't know if it was this hymn book, it was one of the standard hymn books that, that mo many of the independent Baptist churches use, and picked out 164 songs and categorized them. We have this on the website, by the way, this message, Marks of Good Song Leading, and this list of songs categorized. And uh, one problem is we always sing uh, uh, four or five songs. The four or five songs we sing. But there's a lot of songs in the songbook. And uh, variety. God obviously loves variety. There's 150 songs in his songbook. And so God loves variety. And I love variety. I think most people do. But maybe they don't because we end up with four or five songs. But there's songs, as far as the category goes, there's two major categories. And we started with this. Colossians 3, 16. Singing one to another and singing to the Lord. Songs directed toward man. And uh, picked out 164 examples under these categories. They're songs of exhortation. For example, His Way With Thee, number 307 in your songbook. His Way With Thee. Now what is this all about here? Beautiful song, His Way With Thee. Would you live for Jesus and be always pure and good? Would you walk with him within the narrow road? Would you have him bear your burden, carry all your load? Let him have his way with you. What's that? It's preaching, it's exhortation. Let him have his way with you. You want all these good things? Let him have his way with you. Surrender. His power can make you what you ought to be. His blood can cleanse your heart and make you free. His love can fill your soul and you'll see what's best for him to have his way with thee. Powerful. And when we're singing, that's what we're supposed to be doing. It's not just me. The song service is not about me. It's not a private time. We should worship the Lord privately. But the song service in the church is not me and the Lord. It's not private. It's congregational, right. corporate. Yeah. And we're singing to the rest of the congregation, let him have his way with you. And if we really did that from our heart, it would change the song service. And it wouldn't take a lot of people to do it. It would be a lot more spiritual. Songs of exhortation. Here's another one, a lovely one, 309. Is your all on the altar? See, who is he talking? Is your all on the altar? He's not talking to the Lord. He's talking to the congregation. You've longed for sweet peace and for faith to increase and have earnestly, fervently prayed but you cannot have rest or be perfectly blessed until all on the altar is laid. And, and my favorite, I guess, 332, Trust and Obey, one of my favorites. 
as far as songs of exhortation, because this is the Christian life in a nutshell. 332, trust and obey. When we walk with the Lord in the light of His Word, what a glory He sheds on our way. While we do His good will, He abides with us still, and with all who will trust and obey. Trust and obey. See, there's the exhortation. Trust and obey, for there's no other way to be happy in Jesus but to trust and obey. Preaching through music. We saw that they prophesied through the music. Prophesying through a musical instrument. And then there's songs of encouragement. Great songs of encouragement. How about 89? 89, God will take care of you. How we need encouragement. How many troubles we have in life. And the songbook, therefore, is full of this kind of thing. Songs of encouragement. Be not dismayed, whatever be tied, God will take care of you. Beneath His wings of love abide, God will take care of you. God will take care of you through every day or all the way. He will take care of you. God will take care of you. How powerful that is. But not if it's just sung without any thought. Maybe you're thinking about Seboeth or Ebenezer. No, if you think about these and it's from the heart, we're not just thinking about ourselves, but the rest of the congregation, and we're exhorting one another in the Lord in these mighty hymns, how powerful that is. There'll be no dark valley. Jesus comes, 38. Songs of commitment. Look at number 335. Songs of commitment. 335. Songs of commitment. And this is, this is very personal. Sweet are the promises, kind is the word, dearer far than any message man ever heard. Pure was the mind of Christ, sinless I see. He the great example is and pattern for me. Where he leads, I'll follow. It's talking about the character of Jesus, and all the wonderful attributes of Jesus, and the, the, and the response is, where he leads, I'll follow. Songs of commitment, songs of evangelism. Now, this is a great ones, of course, to choose for Sunday morning or the service that happens to have the most lost people there. You must be born again. One of my favorites, 265, the, the, the expression that Jesus used to, Nebuchadnezzar, uh, to uh, Nicodemus that night, 265. A ruler once came to Jesus by night to ask him the way of salvation and light. The master made answer in words true and plain. You must be born again. Songs of evangelism. Look and live. My brother live. 268. And then, those are songs directed to men. And then there's songs directed toward God. We should have worship. We don't need rock and roll to worship the Lord. In fact, you can't worship the Lord with rock and roll. Not acceptably. But we should worship the Lord. The Bible talks a lot about worship. God loves worship. God requires worship. God wants worship. And many of the hymns are worship hymns. How about worship directly, uh, directed to God? I need the very hour, uh, hour every hour, 92. I need thee every hour. This is worship. This is directed to God. I stand amazed. No, that's not it. 92. I need thee every hour, most gracious Lord. No tender voice like thine can peace afford. I need thee every hour. I need thee every hour. I need thee. Oh, bless me now, my Savior, I come to thee. Well, that's more like a prayer. And it, it, but it's addressed directly to the Lord. Great is thy faithfulness. What's the number of that one? Great is thy faithfulness is a great worship song. Number 453. Great worship song. Great is thy faithfulness. Oh, God, my Father. See, it's directly to God. There is no shadow of turning with thee. Thou changest not thy compassions, they fail not. As thou hast been, thou forever will be. Great 
is thy faithfulness. It's a worship song. To God be the glory. Oh, worship the King. Jesus, I am resting, resting. My Jesus, I love thee. Those are worship songs. Our great Savior, come thou almighty King. Rock of ages. It's addressed to God. And then there's worship, meditative worship type hymns where you're thinking about God, such as number 20. What a wonderful Savior. Now this is not addressed to, directly to God, but it's thinking about God. Christ has for sin atonement made. What a wonderful Savior. We are redeemed. The price is paid. What a wonderful Savior. What a wonderful Savior is Jesus, my Jesus. See, we're, we're singing about God and all of His glorious attributes. That's, that's worship. That's pure worship. And you can see that in the Psalms. And then there's testimony hymns that are, uh, fall into the category of worship, such as my faith has found a resting place in number 143. This is a testimony about God. My faith has found a resting place, not in device nor creed. I trust the ever-living one, his wounds for me shall please. I need no other argument. I need no other plea. It is enough that Jesus died and that he died for me. And perhaps that falls into the category of testimony to man and, and also worship to God. But there are many hymns, many types of hymns in our hymn book. And if a song leader really wants to, he can expand the, the congregation's knowledge of God through music and and, uh, and, and build up the church spiritually, it can be a very powerful ministry in the church. And so, we have looked at six marks, leadership, preparation, edification, spirituality, truth, enthusiasm, and then one more, and that is diversity, which really we've covered in a way, but... Too many churches are stuck in a rut. Victory in Jesus is a great song. But I, I, uh, th there was a church, several churches I've, well, two churches that I was a member of, they sung it almost every week. And uh, there's a lot of songs in the songbook. Even a wonderful song can grow a bit tiresome. Hundreds of songs, variety. New songs should be introduced. And who's going to introduce them if the song leader doesn't introduce them? Well, nobody will. The choir director, of course, is also involved. But if, even if a song leader doesn't know music, he can go and find a musician and say, let's, let's find some new songs. It's a matter of wanting to and thinking about it. Pastor Don Williams in Indiana says, As for learning new songs, my family regularly picks out a new song from our hymnal and works on learning it for a couple weeks. Then we introduce it to the congregation as a special and begin to sing it in the song services. Our church has learned a new, lot of new songs this way. Variety is a good thing to introduce into a song service. We try to do this in our song services in Nepal. There's many ways to introduce variety and make things a little interesting. The musicians can drop out while the congregation sings a cappella. Hello. One verse can be sung by the women and another verse by the men. The choir or a soloist can be accompanied by the congregation sometimes, change the musical background, uh, many things. The chorus can be sung with a little more enthusiasm as the song progresses. Some songs can be sung as a round, and there's many ways to introduce variety. Diversity into a song service. We, we saw that the music ministry was very important in the temple and in the tabernacle under David, under Solomon, and it was a big part of the worship of the, of the prophesying, and that they prophesied not just through the preachers, the prophets, but they prophesied through singing and even, even by playing instruments. Let's pray. Father, we thank you for your, the Word of God. 
We thank you for the freedom to have churches these days. We pray we can continue to have this freedom, Lord. And Lord, that we'd use it to be serious and very diligent in our service to Thee. And we thank you in Jesus' name. Amen.